Hello and welcome to Farside Farmmaker, a podcast with John Mark Osborne and Michael Richard talking about everything Farmmaker. Hello, I'm Michael Richard. And I'm John Mark Osborne. And welcome to Farside Farmmaker. Today we're going to talk about the development process because there are a lot of things that go into developing a project successfully. And we want to share those ideas and concepts with you. So, John, tell me what the process is for you. Well, the first step is listening because somebody's going to call you on the phone or send you an email, but eventually it's going to be a phone call. Nobody ever makes a contract over email, at least that I've seen before. And so you're going to have to sit down and listen to your client and they're going to want to tell you a whole bunch of stuff. And sometimes they're going to tell you stuff that's really not important, but you still need to listen to them because you need to build a rapport with them and you need to listen to what they want to say. And they'll eventually start listening to you once you've listened to them. It's just, it's just a psychological thing. If you listen to them, they'll listen to you. So you give them that chance to pour out everything they want to say and the likelihood of getting the job goes way up. And so the first thing you have to do is just sit there and listen. Don't tell them anything unless they ask a question. Just listen, write down notes and things like that. That would be my first step. And that, you know, a lot of people forget about that step because they're, they're you know, thinking about, okay, the development process is, you know, I've got to make, a, you know, a document and I've got to start programming. Well, this, a lot of stuff happens before you ever start actually working on a project. Yeah, and I'm going to just interject something here. When we talk about listening, you really need to listen. You can't be thinking about what you're going to say next. You've got to be listening wholeheartedly to what the client is telling you and making notes so that you don't forget anything that's important and just keeping that going. But listening is the most important thing. There's an old adage, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth. We should be listening as twice as much as we're talking. And it's very true. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, even here, I listen to you but also think about what I'm going to say just on these podcasts. It's important to listen to the person because you never know where they're going to go. And you, if you're not having a conversation, you're, you want to have one conversation, not two conversations. And so it's very important to listen to people. My mom taught me that early on in life that you listen to people and you, you nod and you say yes. And, and you should do that with your clients. You need, want them to know that you're listening to them and that what they're saying is important. Even if it might end up down the line that what they're saying doesn't have any relevance because they're telling about an aspect of the business that means nothing about it, you still should listen to them. And, you know, it may come up later that that little important fact, even though it doesn't help with the development of the solution, helps you to talk to that person and understand their business better. Right. And if in the conversation you bring in something that was said 15 minutes ago, that they said 15 minutes ago, say, oh, yeah, you, you, you mentioned this. The fact that you've actually listened and remembered and brought it back really does a lot for giving you the extra credibility that you need to get hired. Absolutely. And so let's jump to the person decides that they want to hire you and you're in what's called the planning stage. Some people think that you go straight to your computer and start programming. No, you have to plan really well. Now, Different projects, different things. If you're just doing a simple uh, couple thousand dollar contact manager, you won't really need to plan a lot. I get that. But once you get into, you know, five or 10 tables and, and, you know, more than $5,000 that somebody's paying you, you have to do some degree of planning. And how much you do depends on how complex the project is. So you may just have some notes from the client. A lot of times I give the client the opportunity to make their own requirements document because it's a, you know, less than $10,000 job. So I let them write down what their workflow is. And then we have a conversation about that workflow. And I fill in some things like that they may not have considered in their whole idea. And I help them along and I do this for free. Now, if you get a 20 or $30,000 job, and I know Michael will disagree with me on this, but we'll give him a chance to talk in a second. You want to go start going into something a little more sophisticated, which is what I call a requirements document, which precisely details almost everything you're going to do. I don't go as far as putting every single field in there, but I go as far as putting every single feature in there. You know, you have to have these tables and you have to have these scripts and you have to have these reports and things like that so that when you get down to the end 
or, or I should say, when you quote somebody, you attach it to that document and say, for this price, I'm giving, I'm just going to charge you $10,000. This is what it's going to do. And that requirements document, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I want to give Michael a chance to, to comment on this stuff. Well, it's an, it, you know, we have different approaches on different feelings on this, John. We've discussed this. One of the reasons that I typically don't do a requirement document is when you give somebody the detail that you're talking about, basically you're giving them a roadmap that they can go out and give to another developer and you've given a lot of thought and a lot of consideration to something they're just going to pass on and they're going to hire somebody who isn't as good as you or I who will take the job for less and you've just made their job much, much easier. So my approach is somewhat different. When I go into the client, um, I ask two questions of every single person in the company and I ask them over and over again. And the, the first question, which is the most important is, what drives you the most nuts? <laughs> because when you ask that question and you get an answer, you've immediately pinpointed an area that is affecting their daily business, their daily life. It's driving them nuts. Now, if you can eliminate that bottleneck, because that's what it is, if you can eliminate that bottleneck, then you are moving forward with the project. And when everybody is telling you what drives you the most, them the most nuts, you're really getting to the heart of the problem company-wide, not just individually, because what drives the CEO mad is not going to be the same as what drives the data entry person mad. So exactly. the answers are different. The other question I ask, which is just as important, is I say, why are you doing that? And a lot of the time they'll say, well, we've always done it that way. And my answer to that is, no, I'm sorry, that's not a, a reason. That's an excuse. If you don't have a good reason for doing this, you shouldn't be doing it. Now, if you've got a good reason, we'll keep it in and let's talk about it. But a lot of the time there isn't a good reason. It's just they're so conditioned to doing something because they've always done it that way. And they don't think that maybe they're wasting their time. Yeah, it's one of the most common problems I run into as well is that they're used to doing something and they don't want to change, even if it's 10 times better. But let me go back to what I was saying. There's, I have two different kinds of requirements documents. One is the one that the client lists everything that they wanted to do. And I spend an hour or maybe two, because it's a small job, filling out that document. And to me, that's not a waste of my time. It's time I would have spent with somebody making sure that they know how much it's going to cost. The other kind of requirements document is where I go in and I build it completely for them. That's on the more expensive projects. I do interviews like you were talking about. You talk to them and you produce this document that lists everything they want to do. And then that's where the price is attached. Either kind of the requirements document, I attach a price to it. And I have to have something that points to it. And I say, look, this needs to be everything you want. Don't assume it. I don't want to have an example file uh, from Access that shows me what you want. I don't want a screenshot from a program that you used to use to describe what you want this project to do. I need to have it written down so we, the end, the reason why I want this stuff written down is so that we don't have any disagreements, so that we get down to them and we say, hey, it's not listed in there. This is not part of the price. You need to list everything in there. And so that's why I think these requirements documents are so handy. But a lot of them, like I said, are more informal, but they're still documents that we exchange. And it's a sort of a contract between the client and I saying, this is what I'm going to build for this price. Right. And I don't disagree with any of that, John. What's the next step for you, though? The next step would be... Uh, probably, and it's kind of in the same step, is producing an ERD or an entity relationship diagram. This is the most important step that I can think of because it's and not on simple projects. It does matter on simple projects to some degree, but sometimes you can just take a piece of paper and write out an ERD for a simple project in, in a couple of minutes and you know it's right. But when you have 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 tables and they're all interacting with each other, that ERD can change over time significantly. I've sat down in four or five sessions with a client and 
gone over what I call scrubbing that ERD to make sure that we can do everything they want. I go, can I do this report? Okay, I'm looking at the ERD. It's like the picture of the structure of everything. So if you've never created an ERD or an entity relationship diagram, you need to do that. And the significance of it for larger projects is gigantic. You have to have one. If you don't, you're likely to fail. I typically don't do that either, John. And the reason I don't is because my mind works in a kind of bizarre way and I I just see the whole thing in my head when I'm discussing the project and I've already formulated what that ERD is by the time the conversation is is over and I've made notes and, and I remember what I'm thinking. So doing the ERD is really a superfluous step for me because I'm not going to share it with the client. I'm just going to I know what I want to do and what I need to do and the client generally won't be interested in it anyway. They just want a solution. So going all technical with them, to me, to my mind, is not necessary. But that's just the way I work. It's not the way everybody works. My brain works in a funny way. I think a lot of people do work the way that you work, and there's nothing wrong with it. If that's the I don't want to come across that way at all. And I think this is a, probably a good time from one of my favorite stories that you told me you know, offline, which is your first job about how you got it and how you did it. I don't know if you remember that story off the top of your head. I don't. I was wondering if you could maybe share it with everyone because I think it's pertinent here. Well, I took on a project um, with absolute blind faith that I could do it. I accepted a deadline that was ridiculous, but I thought that I could fill it in no time at all because I didn't have the benefit of all the experience I now have and knowing how long these things take. And, and what version of FileMaker was this with? This was FileMaker 2. Or no, maybe it was, no, I think it was FileMaker Plus. I mean, this is back in 1987. And it was in the very early days of Claris having bought, uh, or Apple having bought FileMaker from Neshoba Systems, I think it was. And so the first week of this ridiculously short deadline of three weeks, I literally stared at the computer for eight hours a day without touching a single thing. And then all of a sudden, I woke up one morning and I went, oh, I know exactly how to do this. It's just it was as clear as day. It couldn't have been any clearer. And because I'm just used to thinking outside the box and letting my subconscious work in whatever way it chooses to, I'm confident enough when I'm building and developing a solution, even at the early stages, that I pretty much know everything that's needed and of course, there are going to be changes and there are going to be additions, but spending the time to build a, a complex requirements doc or an entity relationship diagram isn't just within my wavelength. I mean, I will do it on occasion, but it's mostly just scribbles on a piece of paper or, a, or just thinking about something rather than formalizing it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I, I think I like that story so much after hearing it the second time because you sat in front of your computer for multiple days in a row after finding out everything about their business and your brain went through and decided what they needed and you, you knew their business so well after it's planning so much that all of a sudden you knew what to do and in a fervor you programmed everything. And I think we're more alike than different, even though we have different ways of approaching. I'm making a requirements document document almost every time. And that helps me to think about and understand it. And you're thinking about it inside your head and you compartmentalize all that stuff and you can set it into a little think tank in there and get the work done. But the, 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 we're doing the same thing, which is doing a large amount of planning. We don't get to the client and then start building. We first make sure we know the entire picture of their business and then we program it. Absolutely. I was once asked, this is an interesting story. I was once asked to, for somebody who really wasn't very computer savvy, what I did for a living. And I said, well, imagine that you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. It's a thousand pieces and every single piece is pure white. There's no picture. So you're putting this thousand piece jigsaw puzzle together, only you're doing it in your head and you're doing six of them simultaneously. And that's kind of what it feels like sometimes is we're just we've got all this stuff that's in our head and we move from one to the other without any difficulty. It's effortless 
because our brains are just used to compartmentalizing it and knowing what we need to know at the particular time and where we are on which project. So let's move on to another major point, I think, and I think you do this all in your head, but what I do once I get my requirements document done, and it's kind of all the same thing, but you know, the, you, you're know you kind of in a, a loop if you want to compare it to FileMaker where you're planning this, you're making a requirements document, or you're thinking about it, whichever way you do it, and you're creating the ERD, but the whole time you're analyzing it as well. You're making sure, and I called this scrubbing before, and that's part of it, but you're analyzing everything. You don't just want to jump off the cliff and hope things, you know, there's a body of water down there. You want to figure out everything about that cliff and 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 how much wind is coming and things like that. And, and the more you think about it, the easier it's going to be to program. It's almost like having a coloring book where somebody's done the outlines. Your planning stage is making the outlines, and then when you program, you just put the colors inside the outlines. And so don't forget to plan and then analyze and then plan and analyze and keep going back through a loop on that, all that stuff. So that you make sure you get down to exactly what that person, and it won't be perfect. You'll make mistakes and you'll have to fix them, but you'll make less mistakes. Well, it goes back to what you and I were talking about offline is that when you're a newbie to this field, you make mistakes, lots of them. And the more and more you do it, the less mistakes you make because you've already learned which ways don't work. I mean, we've gone down, you and I have gone down every blind alley we could possibly go at some point during our learning process. The difference is now we know not to do that. And we very rarely do end up where we are wrong. I mean, it does happen, of course, you can't avoid it, but it's very infrequent now as opposed to being very frequent in the early days. So let's move on to the next stage, which is probably pricing. How do you do pricing? How do you determine how much to charge somebody? Because people don't want to just say, hey, I work by the hour. They want to know how much is it going to cost me in the end? Because that's really the most important thing. It doesn't matter how much you charge per hour. It matters how much you can get the project done for. So quoting accurately, how do you do that? I don't, don't and won't take on fixed price projects ever. I only work on an hourly basis. And when people say to me, well, why do you do that? I said, look, if I give you a price, the chances are that the project scope is going to change during the development process. And it may well be that I'm going to end up doing more work than I anticipated when I bid you this project. Now, the only way I can safeguard myself is to bid the project so high that that factor is taken into account and I can't undervalue my time. Now, when I do it on an hourly basis, you pay exactly for the hours that I'm charging you. I'm working as fast as I can and you're going to pay the right price for the job based on my hourly rate. If you're charging a price, uh, you run the risk of having this scenario happen the only person who makes out like a bandit is the developer and if they've charged enough to counter all the eventualities then the client's paying too much so in that case the developer wins if the client if the developer is charging too little then one of two things will happen is he'll get bored with the job and another job that will come on that is paying better and he goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this one. And the other one can just wait because they're not paying me enough to warrant my time because I can now get more. So that's why I work on an hourly basis. And I know some people um, don't, but it's, it's the way I work. Yeah, I definitely can't disagree with if you trust somebody, which sometimes is hard to in this world then working on an hourly basis gift definitely gives a win-win for both parties. And I, I totally see that and totally agree with that. And I do work by the hour sometimes. I give my clients the option of me working hourly or doing a contract. And lately it's been a lot more of working hourly, but here's what I think the contract offers people is they only they, they need to budget the money. And if they don't know, have an idea how much it's going to cost, then 
they can't convince everybody say, let's go ahead. Well, we don't know how much it's going to cost. It's going to work for a hundred dollars an hour or whatever it is. And, but we don't know how much the actual project is going to cost it. That makes them fearful. And so some people need to have that contract price. And along with that has to go a requirements document, which is why you probably don't have one because you don't need one because there's no need to connect a price to what they're asking for. So I can see how that works because you get a lot of business through word of mouth and people say, Hey, this guy's great. Just, just go with them. And, and that's probably what happens. And, and they call you up and you say, Hey, this is how much, gonna, you know, do you ever give them a ballpark price though? Oh, I always give them a ballpark price. I learned many years ago how to estimate very accurately based on a conversation. And you're going to laugh at this, but I have found over the years that I take the number I thought of first in terms of hours and I multiply it by three. And I'm very rarely more than 10% out either way. Now, obviously, that is going to change as the client decides and sees what we're doing and then says, well, we'd like this as well. Now that's a different set of requirements and then you can discuss it with them and you can say, okay, this can be done, but how important is it to you? Because it's going to add 10 or 20 or 30 hours. Is it important to you right now or do we leave it on the back burner and do it in stage two? So I'm trying to give them the best estimate or guesstimate I can based on years and years of doing this. And I just generally very, very accurate in what my assessments are. Yeah, I have a little equation I do where I take the number of tables and I have a, a, a number I associate with it. And then if it's a really complex table, I'll probably double it or something like that. And then I'll take the number of reports that they want and I'll assign a, an average number to that. And then I'll take the number of major features they want. Let's say they want to do something like integrate with you know, some website or something like that. And I'll add that in there. And then there's some discretion in my mind about, you know, okay, here's a number I've got through a simple equation. I'll add to it. And and I've I've become fairly accurate, but I use that kind of as a starting point to get me in the ballpark. And then uh, you you just have to really sit down and think about it. You have to have the experience. I think that's what we're both saying here, the experience to be able to price something out because it's, it's not, it's not easy. It's really not easy. And what I'm worried about um, with the big jobs is feature creep, like you talked about, you mentioned it. And if you're working by the hour, you don't have to worry about that. But if you're working on the project, that's why I've got to get stuff written down. Otherwise, if somebody's going to say, we'll do this, and well, isn't that included inside the price? Yeah. And, you know, I did years ago take on one project at a fixed price, because at the time I was really short of work. And... I took this on against my better judgment because it was a guaranteed price and they were willing to give me a big deposit. And it turned out to be one of the worst decisions I'd ever made because the project was just much more complicated than the client had been able to explain. And we didn't really discover this until we were well in the process of developing it. Well, I've got to tell you this and I've got to tell you that. And oh my God, you know, so... As it happened, the project worked out really well because the client was super and he appreciated that I'd gone over and above and he ended up giving me extra money to make it worth my while because he knew what I'd gone through. But you can't rely on that. That's why I I like to hedge my bets. And it's a conversation I have with almost every client. They say, well, why can't we just bid, pay you on a project basis? And I said, because it's doing you a disservice if I take it. I want to give you the best value for money and the best value for money I can give you is to charge you for the time that it takes me. And I work as fast as I possibly can. So I'm not going to beat this horse to death, but this is the reason why I have a requirements document so that they can't say, well, what about this? And isn't this included? And no, if it's not written down, it doesn't get included. Right. And absolutely, doing what you're doing, John, it, it's much more essential than what I'm doing because of the fact that they're paying by the hour and they don't really care what they want to add in. It's up to them if they want to pay for it. But with fixed prices, you've got to cross every I and dot every T or cross every T and dot every I. But it, the reality is that a lot of the time, clients really don't know what they want exactly because they don't understand what can be done 
So it's dealing with a deck that may be a few cards short, and you have to take that into, into consideration. And that's where it becomes very tricky. And it's just years of experience that's taught both of us how to be accurate and how not to lose money. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. Every single project of mine always goes over budget. Every single time. Because, like you said, people don't necessarily know what they want. Or they see something that you do and they go, I want more of that. And they add on to it. It's feature creep and it's a natural thing. It's the same thing. I'm redoing my backyard. I'm like, hey, I'd like to have this. I didn't think about that. Well, they're going to charge me extra. And that's, I guess, just a different way of looking. I'd like to work on every project by the hour because it's going to give people, uh, you know, the best value for their money. But some people just won't. The, the industry wants to have contracts. And I think that you have to consider that when you're doing business. Uh, I think you're probably one of the only people I know. And I, I'd invite comments from, from people who are listening to this podcast. But I think you're one of the only people I've ever met who won't work by contract. Um, and I do both. And, I, and it works well for me. But to not do contracts at all, I would think you'd be losing a lot of business. But I think you're, you're a special person. And, you know, because you've got such a great, uh, you know, reputation uh, with the clients that you work with, they're so happy you get a lot of word of mouth. I think that helps you to go down the road that you're going. And I think my point here is that, you know, we're giving you some guidelines. We're giving you two different viewpoints here. You need to go the direction you want to go. And it might be different than either of our directions. Choose your own way and what works best for you and realize it may change over the years as well. Absolutely. I mean, I'm always explaining to clients why I don't take on contract projects. They say, well, why don't you do this? And I say to them, because the likelihood is that you are going to pay more than you should. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to pay as little as you need to. And do do I shoot myself in the foot sometimes because I don't charge for some of the stuff that I do because I just don't feel that I, I can justify it in my own head? Of course. But that's just part of what we do. It's you know, it swings and roundabouts, you win some, you lose some. And as long as you end up ahead at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. It's 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 an it's an interesting game to be played here. But let's move on. I think we've made our points about that. And let's talk about uh, something I think is really important. Once you start working, and you tell me how you feel about this, because you may have a different opinion, but I want to have one point of contact at that company. I've worked a lot of times where they give out my email address and everybody's sending me bugs or, or, uh, you know, telling me what to do with the database. And it never ends up good because there's multiple point of views. You need to filter everything that goes into this project through a single person. So that person that the company needs to accept all the bugs, feature requests and decide whether to pass them along to me or not. And they have to try them out. They can't just get them and then pass them to me. They have to actually verify that they're actually true. Cause I get all kinds of bugs. I go, well, he, they, do you know how to reproduce this? Cause I can't. And he says, no, I don't know. I didn't try it. So that, so this point of contact, you have to train them and let them know that you're going to spend some time with me making sure this project goes through smoothly and you need to go ahead and be the filter. So you have to train them a little bit about how it works. And I can tell you, if you have one point of contact, almost always, unless it was a gigantic project, that one point of contact is really going to make your project turn out much better. Oh, absolutely. But there is a caveat here, John. You've got to have the right person because sometimes, and I had a case recently where the client, get, the point man at the company was really completely and utterly unsuitable to be the point man because he didn't understand technology. He wasn't able to convey what he was trying to convey. He was very bad at passing on information. He was very slow to respond. So I was constantly waiting and it was a, a constant battle. And so you have to make sure that you've got that right person. And the difficulty is, how do you deal with it? How do you tell the client that the guy they put in charge of this project isn't really the person who should be in charge of the project? That's a very tricky and difficult thing to deal with. And fortunately, I haven't had to do it very often. No, I can remember a client just came to mind, one that was local, who never understood how his business worked in electronic form. So he knew how his business worked. He was a great salesperson, very likable. But when I tried to convert what he did 
in his business into electronic format into FileMaker, he didn't understand the need for certain tables and how things worked. And ultimately, it ended up with me losing the client. He went with somebody else. And I actually knew who it was. And I talked to him and said, you're going to have a lot of difficulty. You should have gone and talked to his subordinate who understands technology better. Because I know once I got the database done, that he would have understood it and the other guy would have explained it to him. But you got to find the right person. And he just was not the right person. It was, it was his, uh, his employee who really knew technology and understood what I was talking about. So that's that 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 unfortunately was a, a sad story for me. It didn't work out well, and you know I learned from it though. Hopefully, and and I'll be able to better handle that situation in the future. And like everything in you know in life, it's a learning experience. You know we find things that don't work properly, and we evaluate it, and we go, yeah, I could if I did that. If this happens again, I'm going to handle this differently, because we. The truth of the matter is, John, and a lot of people don't realize this, you don't learn anything at all from success. You only learn from failure. Because when it's all success and everything works, you just go, oh, I'm doing everything right. And you don't think about maybe you could have done something a little differently. But when it, you do get the failure, then it forces you to reevaluate your position and your mental standpoint or viewpoint or whatever and you learn from those mistakes so i think it's as important in life to manage and accept the fact that you're going to fail and it's okay to fail because you're going to learn something from it and that lesson will stand you in good stead as you move forward yeah when i'm teaching classes i take people down the wrong road a lot of the times to help them learn better I don't just teach them the right way to do things. I teach them the wrong way. Sometimes I'll actually take them down that road and they'll go, well, why'd you do that? Well, now you know the wrong way to do it. You know why it's the wrong way. And you've maybe not learned the way I learned by doing it the wrong way and, and having it you know, slap me in the face. But I've given you a feeling for what the wrong way is. And, and it really helps you to, to learn. And I'm just a really a sum of all my failures. And that's what makes me good at FileMaker because I've made so many more mistakes than let's say a person starting off with FileMaker. Yeah, well, you haven't made as many mistakes as I have. I can guarantee you that. It sounds like a, we're going to have a, a, we'll have to list all our mistakes and compare them at the end of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but let's keep it between ourselves. <laughs> so the other thing I want to talk about, and, and, you know, if you look on the internet and you, you see these things that says, here's the seven or the six or the nine steps for development. Yeah, you could do that, um, but all these things, some overlap a bit. And one of the things I want to talk about is the need for constant communication. I often sit down with my clients, if they send me a bug report, and we'll go over it through GoToMeeting or whatever kind of screen sharing software you want to use, and program some of the stuff right in front of their eyes. Not only does it teach them what I do, it teaches them a little bit about FileMaker and they understand and I can talk to them about alternatives. Hey, you know, I know you want to do this, but if I did this, it'd be a lot less expensive. It might even be more effective, uh, you know, and we can discuss it and I can actually even sometimes show them. And I think a lot of developers, what they end up doing is, and, and it's funny, I had a, I was giving a presentation at Macworld and one guy came up uh, during the question said, Hey, I wish my consultant had planned a little bit better and interviewed me and talked to me a little bit more instead of just producing a solution after one meeting, because then he would have known that I worked at a high school and not a grade school. And there's a big difference between the two. And I think you need to, to really talk to people before you start programming and all through the process. Oh, it's absolutely essential, and not just the not just the client. It's the people who are working on it. And you know, if somebody sends in a bug report, I don't. I just say, okay, I need to get on a screen sharing session. I need to have you show me what you're doing, because you may be doing something I never thought anybody in a million years would do, and. It may be that you're just doing something wrong, and I can simply look at it and point you in the right direction. And it will also allow me to adjust that element so that it becomes more intuitive or less confusing. 
and that's how we're getting the feedback to make a better solution. But being able to see and watch what somebody's doing when it comes to a bug is, to my mind, the value of it is far in excess of the time that it takes to do it. Right, especially since they're not trained to write bugs. I mean, I was trained for a year in software quality assurance on how to write bugs, and there's a certain way to write them so they're, they're quick to read and easy to replicate, but most people can't do that. So what's the next best thing? Screen sharing, like you said, get them on there, have them show it to you. Right. now, And the other thing I typically do when somebody sends in a support request is I call them up and I set a screen sharing session and I show them how to do it. And then immediately afterwards, I go back in and I record a video of that entire process so that they can have it as a referral source. And if it happens again, they can look at it or they can show it to somebody else. One, that actually brings me on to another subject. I'm constantly doing videos on the programs and the solutions I'm developing. I'll do a small section and I'll make a video. And there are two reasons for that. Is One, it gives the client something to look at and refer to. But secondly, the process of doing a video actually brings up all the bugs that are in the system that you haven't spotted. So I will start, oh, that doesn't work properly. Stop, fix it, keep on going. So it's a process of helping me refine and make sure that what I'm doing is working 100% because when you're not doing the data entry or doing stuff that involves the data, it's easy to overlook something that really should be obvious if you were. Yeah, and, and I haven't done this a lot uh, or at all, what you're talking about, but you're starting to convince me it might be a good idea. And, and I'm thinking, how hard is it to make a video? Not really hard at all. I mean, you know, it's something that's right on the top of your mind. You don't have to write down everything you're going to say. You just kind of, you know, informally do it. And it takes you a couple minutes. But for the client, it makes a gigantic difference as far as them, you know, liking the work that you're doing, understanding what you're doing, and retaining that information. So I think I might start doing it because it's really not that hard for me to make a video. No, and, you know, used to it. Just please keep your hand off the mouse and don't be moving it around like a demented madman. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll never touch the mouse again. I'll use all keyboard controls after this. Something I like to say, the customer is always right. And I know everybody says this, um, but I think it's a really good thing to remember. But also, and we talked a little bit about this, but I really want to make emphasize this point. It's your job to make sure that the customer doesn't make a bad choice. I've had so many projects come my way that were steered in the wrong way for whatever reason. Maybe the developer wasn't very good, or maybe they didn't uh, try to steer the client away from doing something crazy with an interface. You know, maybe they're trying to replicate the iTunes interface when FileMaker doesn't do that really well. I don't know, but the customer is always right. And sometimes you need to steer them away from costly or poor performing techniques. And so many uh, developers I know out there just write down what the client wants and does exactly what they say. You're the project manager. Your job is to make sure they know the alternatives and what could possibly happen with this so they don't get a poorly performing solution or get cost charged a lot of money. It's, it's, you've got to have some honor when you're doing this. You've got to have some morals. And, and one of those things is sometimes to disagree with your customer, but in a nice way. You say, hey, I can, I'll be glad to do that for you. But if I do that, I think you, you know, if we spend a couple minutes talking about this, you might see that there's a better way to do this and it'll cost you a lot less money. Yeah, you can't be afraid to say no to the customer or, you know, question their decisions because they're not always coming from a position of knowledge. In fact, 90% of the time they're not. So we have to insert our expertise and our values and prevent the customer from making mistakes. And sometimes they're going to get really irritable when when you say, well, this is a really bad idea. And you just have to stand your ground and be willing to explain it to a point until they go, yeah, I get it. I understand what you're talking about. Because that way you're providing a really valuable service as opposed to just rubber stamping everything they tell you they want. And it's a bad choice in the first place to do that. So you have to have chutzpah, as they say, 
Uh, do you know the definition of chutzpah? I'd like to know. I've, I've heard it before. A classic example of the guy who goes to court charged with murdering his parents and he pleads to the court for mercy because he's an orphan. That's chutzpah. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. I'm, I'll have to look it up after this session here to, to get a. Yeah, you won't find that definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you, yeah, you can apply it to a lot of situations. I get what you're saying. And yeah, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. And you are, you are an expert in what you are doing. And you need to express those that expertise to the client when it is necessary for the one them to understand they're about to make a mistake. So let me ask you, taking to a different subject, do you ever have problems with your clients not testing enough, not testing properly, kind of just, you know, not looking at things? Yes. And again, the way I deal with that is when I deliver a build, I schedule a screen sharing session and we go through it and I have them work with it and show me what they're doing and get the feedback from them. And sometimes if it's a simple piece of simple, quick change, I'll just log in and make that change and then get back out and look at it again. So I'm kind of forcing the review process on them. And I tell them up front that this is not a process that I can do without their input. It's a collaborative, iterative process. And they need to put time aside to review the work that I've done in a timely manner. I don't want them to deliver a build and then they give me three weeks later, I get some feedback. I want it within a couple of days. And so I always schedule a screen sharing session. If necessary, I'll schedule two, sometimes three to go over stuff. It's complicated and with different people working in different elements so I'm forcing the situation, but you've got to get accurate feedback from sufficient testing. And a lot of the time they hate it. Absolutely. They do. They don't, I don't think they realize that they have to be involved in this process. They don't just hand off their business workflow and then we pr produce a perfectly working uh, solution. They actually have to sit down and play with it and make sure it works the way they want. And so many of my clients, you know, until halfway through the project, they don't get that. And it's not an easy thing to get them to test. Some will just naturally do it and they'll, they'll test too much and they'll, and I'll have to tell them, look, we don't do the tab order until the end, you know, cause we don't want to keep changing it as we change the database. But, you know, but those are the, the, the better clients. I can at least explain to them, you know, you got to pull back on the reins a little bit, but it's, it's the clients who don't think they have to do anything. They don't have any testing or anything that they do. Uh, during the process and the project's going to turn out poorly. So you have to, like you said, tell them I, what you expect from them in, in, in quantifiable terms. You know, you, you said things like a day or two, I need two days and I'm going to move on to the next module. I need all your feedback right now because what happens in this stage of the project that doesn't get fixed may affect the rest of the project. And that's a big problem. So you have to, you have to work with your clients and convince them and get them to do that testing. Don't just assume they're going to do it. Well, I make it very clear in the initial meetings when I'm talking to them before I take the project on that this is a requirement. It's not, it's not a maybe, it's, it's a necessity. And if they're not willing to commit to that, then I can't help them. Yeah, I agree. And that's, that's the, you know, the part that I've got to do better about too, is not just to, you know, just be straightforward with them and tell them that they have to do this. Now, once you've developed the whole project, you've tested it and it's ready to go out and be used, that's usually called deployment. And that's not the last stage of, of the development process, but it's pretty close because of course you have maintenance and things like that, that you have to do uh, you know, adding new features, of course, features are going to get added on. I mean, I have clients go on for 10 years adding features that, you know, even though the initial project was done, you know, eight years ago, they're, they're, they're for another, uh, you know, for that rest of that eight years, they're still adding features. And so they'll have that. But you need to consider all these stages in that deployment stage when you're going to deploy. Because once you deploy, then you have a whole different development scenario. Do you develop live? 
do you take the solution down and take a copy of it and then when put it back up so they can continue using when you're done developing and testing the new features they've asked for do you import it what what's your process you should know that ahead of time based on what the client's going to do are they going to be having the server up in the cloud or they're going to have it locally at their own business is it going to be a single user which is not very likely but it could happen you've got to consider all these things so you know how it's going to work so you can plan and let the client know this is how we're going to do things for small features i'll work on it live if you want major features i'm probably going to take it down and we're going to have to work on it offline absolutely i mean it's a combination of a lot of different things if if it's a hosted solution, which they almost always are nowadays, um, I insist on having access to the server that the files are on and credentials to log into the admin console so that I can shut them down, pull a file down, make changes, put it back up. And a lot of the time I do that, you know, in the middle of the night when everybody else has gone to bed I'm or gone, gone home, I'm actually working because I don't want to affect what they're doing on a daily basis and I need to get it done before they come into work the next day. Yeah, that's that's a tricky one for me because I tend to, uh, like you don't do a requirements document, I don't work at night. <laughs> so you can be that way and you can get away with that um, because most of the time, once I'm done with the project, we spec it out pretty good. There's no gigantic features in need to get added. I use usually do live development. They want to add a layout that does this or they want to report. That's easy enough to do live. I've been doing it for you know the last 15 years, never had any problems with it, despite what people say. Live development's fine. FileMaker has made constant improvements so that people can do live development. They understand the importance of it. And if developers tell you they can't do live development, yeah, I wouldn't produce the database from scratch on the server. But once it's been deployed, I think it's okay to do some live development as long as it's not, you know, completely changing and doing surgery on it and putting a join table in between two tables that were previously connected or something like that. I would probably go ahead and do it live. Otherwise, yeah, sometimes you pull it down, but you need to know that stuff ahead of time and, and you know, be clear on how you're going to proceed with that and be comfortable about how to do all those processes so that when you have to go ahead and make those inevitable changes, you're ready to do it and know exactly which process will work best for that particular feature and client. Right, exactly. So any last words you want to mention about the development process? Do a sum or anything? No, I think we pretty much uh, covered everything. There's really not much more than we've discussed and it's fairly cut and dried in the process i mean we do it differently you and i it doesn't mean to say that my way is better than yours or your way is better than mine it's just more suited to our particular idiosyncratic method of working and all programmers no matter who they are, are idiosyncratic we have our own way of doing things and we do things the way that we're comfortable with and which we understand and which we are optimized to work at so it's just different approaches, but the fundamentals are the same. You have to do the due diligence at the beginning. You have to understand what you're trying to do. You have to have a clear picture of what it is. But the one thing that I will perhaps just interject here, and this is something that I'm constantly asked how I have ended up working in so many different industries and businesses, and all businesses are fundamentally the same. They have a product or service that they sell or market. That's it. It's only the minutia of the business, how they do that, the changes. And when we're developing a project for a, an industry that we haven't developed for, we learn the intricacies of that business by talking to the people that we're working with. And we become very quickly an expert in that particular industry and business. So it's not a huge leap to take on a project from a, something you've never worked before, because as I say, the fundamentals of the business are the same for every business. Yep, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and if I had to leave people with the final thought, I would say, you're correct. There's not one way to do thing, what, not one way to do a project to do the development process. But I'll say one thing that people constantly forget, and if you take one thing away from this podcast, make sure you plan. So many people are so eager to get the project started, they start programming first and then they plan a little bit and they pro and then they program. Do the planning first. Even if you do things 
Michael's way or some of the things my way or some of the things your own way. The one thing I leave you with is you got to plan. You've got to analyze your solution. You've got to figure out what you're going to do and have a good idea either down on paper or in your head about what you're going to do before you ever start programming. Absolutely. Well, it's been an interesting conversation, John. I think we've uh, probably talked it to death, so we should uh, get off the line and uh, go back and do some real work. That's right. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Fireside Filemaker, a podcast with John Mark Osborne and Michael Richard. We'd love to hear what you think, so please email us at info at firesidefilemaker.com. That's info at firesidefilemaker.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.